afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining another Barometer Readings webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship uh, Manager here at Barometer, and joining me as always is David Burrows, our Chief Investment Officer and uh, Strategist here at Barometer Capital. On today's webcast, David will be pleased to provide a macro overview and, of course, at the tail end of the conversation, be happy to address your questions. So don't be shy. You can email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit me up with your questions on the chat or um, the Q&A link via Zoom. And with that, on this uh, last uh, Tuesday in October, I turn the conversation over to uh, David Burroughs. I think it's, well, we're leading into the end of October. I probably have my dates wrong, Dave. <laughs> Well, I think you're not too you're not too far off. Uh, hey, everybody! Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, we got uh, lots to talk about today. Um, we're sort of into into the meat of earnings season. Uh, earnings have been okay so far. Tonight's an important one. We get Google, we get Microsoft, uh, we get Visa, uh, all positions for us, uh, and um, and we're sort of at an important juncture uh, in the calendar. We're at an important juncture on the charts. Uh, and so let's just delve right in. Uh, I'm going to sort of stick sort of from a high level top down to begin with. You know, we continue to think that we're in a structural bull market, although clearly market has been correcting. Right. We're now uh, uh, we're now 22 months since the market made its high in December of 2021. Uh, we're about 11 percent off the highs. You can see <clears throat> over the last three months, we've had the typical sort of fall, late summer, fall weakness. Uh, we tend to get kind of one 10% correction a year. Uh, markets pulled back in the S&P <clears throat> about 8.3%. Uh, uh, top to bottom, the equally weighted s and is more than that. Uh, it's a little over 11%. Uh, but we're sitting here right at the bottom end of the channel we've been in since October of 22 and the market made its near-term low. Uh, so far, the S&P is holding above a rising 200-day 200 200 moving average. Uh, and uh, stayed, has stayed within the channel. But we're certainly getting tested. S&P 500 probably doing better than the average stock. Uh, and, uh, and you know, certainly we're, we're in that sort of once a year 10 percenter. I think people worry about a 20 percent pullback. You know, the truth is 20 percent pullbacks come but once every three years. 2022, we got about a 24 percent pullback. It would be very unusual for us to have back to back. Uh, difficult years, and it doesn't look like that's the case this year. The equally weighted S&P tells a more sobering story. Uh, from the high at the end of 2021, beginning of 2022, the equally weighted S&P, uh, you know, continues to be lower. We're about uh, 12, sorry, 12.7 percent off the July high uh, and trading below all the moving averages. So it tells you how difficult this market has been. You really have to pick your spots. There's lots of parts of the market that have had a very difficult time. There's a few very large stocks that have made a big difference. But there's also a few sectors that, while they are a relatively small part of the S&P, you know, have done better. So um, one of the things that I've been watching for signs of improvement is to see this equally weighted S&P, the RSP ETF, start to perform better relative to the market cap weighted S&P, which of course gives a much larger weighting to the very large tech stocks. And that is yet to be the case. We've talked about the fact that breadth has been weaker since the beginning of August, uh, and we continue to hold a cash weight. Uh, we have about a 20% cash weight in most portfolios, and there's certain parts of the market that we've been focused in, and there's some certain parts of the market we have been void of. And we'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> Since the market started pulling back on the 26th of July, uh, the TSX is down about 6.65%, the equally weighted S&P 11.7%, the uh, U.S. Uh, long treasury down 16%, the high dividend paying cohort in the market, things that act most like bonds, down about 12%, the all-world index down about 8%. The income portfolio for us is down about 2.8. Uh, the um, the uh, balance portfolio down 2.6. Uh, our equity portfolio uh, down uh, about, sorry, 6% uh, 
uh, long short down three, and our global is down nine. So ahead of the indices, sort of through through this period, you know, any sort of mix of our pools down between kind of like three uh, and four and a half percent. And so we've been working hard at making sure we don't give up too much through a fall correction. Now we get to look forward to what seasonally is a stronger period. And we need to see it begin. Um, I mentioned before around day 200 is when we tend to see the seasonal low. We're, we're in and around those dates right now. Uh, and it's the same for the S&P small cap. When we look at the size of the rally off the lows in October of 22, it has been muted. So <clears throat> either this is going to be the shortest cyclical rally off a low in October 22, or we're just seeing the beginning of it. My guess is that's more likely the case. Outside of the U.S., we are seeing strength in Japan. This is a relative strength line, relative performance versus the S&P 500. So the Japanese uh, stock market currency hedge is trading better than 93% of companies in the S&P. Uh, the India ETF EPI has seen rising relative strength since the, since the lows uh, in March of 2020, trading better than 87% of companies in the S&P. These are important positions in our global portfolio. From a fixed income standpoint, you know, we've talked about the fact that this was a generational low in yields in October of, sorry, in March of 2020. And this has been the sharpest move higher in yields since the beginning of the last bull market in yields or bear market in bonds. So this is really important because it means that things that act like bonds have been challenged. A lot of people might go to the bond market for security in a difficult environment. It hasn't been much solace. Rates fell from 1981 to 2020 and moved sharply higher since then breaking trend in 2022. The aggregate bond index now from the highs down 28%, sorry, 23.4%. We're in an unprecedented third year of a bear market in the bond market, important to avoid bonds. And the long end of the treasury market now down 54%. We are at prices you haven't seen since 2006, 2007, so a long time ago. So it's counterintuitive. A lot of money has gone into the bond market. Uh, we've been avoiding it, uh, but this has been a source of strain. I will note that there was very heavy volume over the last couple of weeks. Very often that could be associated with a capitulation in selling. We'll see. A little bit stronger <clears throat> over the course of this week. Uh, off the lows, but no sign of any change at this point. Stocks relative to bonds continue to outperform. So we have to pick our spots. Within equities, dividend growers relative to bonds also continue to outperform. So from an income perspective, we prefer to focus on dividend growers, companies with an inordinate ability to grow the dividend they pay out where they're generating excess cash from what they need in the business. And it's a growing stream of cash. If we can get a rising dividend stream, that helps us offset the impact of rising interest rates. And that's why the income portfolio has significantly outperformed both stocks and bonds. Commodities. Commodities continue to outperform as well versus both stocks and bonds. They made a turn in 2020, consolidated through the Fed's tightening cycle. And over the last four months, started their march higher again. We think this is the beginning of something that will go on for a longer period of time, partly driven by oil, partly driven by other materials, partly driven by agricultural commodities. And the fact is when a sector has been out of favor a long time starts making new highs, it's significant. We talked <clears throat> a number of months ago about the fact that the uranium producers started to perform well. This is a, a Sprott uranium unit. This is based on physical uranium, has moved out of a bear market, moving sharply higher along with oil. Gold is within a whisper of breaking out of a major cup and handle consolidation that goes all the way back to 2011. Now, these are assets that are generally unloved and not widely held. They are hard assets that tend to do well in a period where rates are a little higher and inflation is higher. So commodities relative to bonds, month by month outperforming. Commodities relative to stocks, 
month by month outperforming. So from a big picture perspective, we remain long-term constructive on equities. We think we are getting close to the end of this you know, bear market we've been going through. And we've been making higher lows since October of 2022 for a year now, still about 12% off the highs. Commodities, we think, do better both than stocks or bonds. They're a very small piece of the overall investing landscape, but it's, it gets an important piece in portfolios to have the types of things that do well in a reflationary environment. We've shown this chart over and over again, but when they start to outperform, they tend to outperform for a period of years versus stocks. Now, it's all interesting to see. <clears throat> it's important to continue to see the evidence, but investors clearly are not convinced because they became so jaded against commodities with any strength, they have been sellers of commodities. At some point, we think it's likely people recognize that the strength is likely here to stay. Let's talk a little bit about the data. We talked uh, last week about the strong payrolls data coming in much stronger than expected. This week, uh, then we talked about the retail sales uh, coming in better than expected. Uh, the trend clearly getting a little bit better there. Uh, today, we had U.S. manufacturing PMIs, which came in better than survey. Uh, global services PMIs, a little bit better. Uh, and the composite PMIs, a little bit better. From an earnings perspective, we'll see how the market reacts to Google and Visa uh, and Microsoft, important stocks uh, in the S&P for sure. Uh, but in general, earnings seem to be coming in a little bit better than expected. So look, we aren't trying to be everywhere. And in this kind of market, it's really important that we be targeted, right? We need to find areas of market leadership, and we'll talk about those in a moment. We're watching always for signs of new leadership to emerge. We haven't seen any in a long time. And then third, in the absence of leadership, we have to have an ability to play defense and keep some dry powder, which is why right now, we have about 20% cash and short-term bonds in all of the portfolios that we manage. We are trying to be tactical. We're trying to pick our spots. We're trying to make sure that we have investment capital and productive assets. We aren't paid to be invested. We're paid to make money and we're doing our very best to find those spots. We use our top-down models to identify sectors and asset classes that are seeing net new inflows of capital. And then we try to identify specific securities that we can use to express that view, looking for securities that have financial characteristics that are good getting better, where we can see net improvement, not just on an absolute basis, but relative to their peers, where they're gaining strength, because the companies that lead within an industry have a high, an easier time raising capital. They have an easier time holding on to their market share. Uh, generally, the leader continues to be the leader. From a breadth perspective, we're trying to find sectors of the market that are over time more and more securities are participating in a rally. That's healthy. Where we see deteriorating breadth or where fewer and fewer companies are holding on or performing well, it tells us we need to be cautious. And so this is why we have a cash weight. We've seen deteriorating breadth since August, which means that we hold on to our cash and wait to see net underlying improvement in the market. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> Last week, we talked about the fact that some of our short-term indicators were showing improvement. This week, virtually all of these indicators backed off over the course of the week. Long-term indicators have yet to turn up, which is why we're holding on to cash. When we look at the percent of stocks in the NYSE that are in uptrends, on this chart, we plot time along the bottom, 2007 through 2023. I've got this data going back to about 1951 <clears throat> and a percentage reading on the y-axis. You can see over time when the percent of stocks performing well got to 30% or below and reversed higher, generally the percent of stocks performing well continued to rise for a period of time until ultimately a high percentage of stocks were performing well. As we sit today, as of today, 30% of companies in the NYSE are in uptrends. That means 30% of companies are performing well. It also means 70% are behaving poorly. 
one of the reasons we don't want to own the index. We want to be targeted. And that list has been getting smaller. What we need to see before we start putting some of that cash to work is for the percent of stocks performing well to start to expand, meaning for the percent of stocks and uptrends to start to rise. That means money's getting put to work. We don't want to fight the tide. So while statistically getting down to this 30% level is important, you can see it can go lower. And so we wait to see that turn. When we look at the percent of stocks in uptrends in the Canadian stock market, same thing, we're at 30% or just below. And again, that 30% line tends to be relevant. So we're probably getting closer. As we mentioned last week, <clears throat> one of the things that does concern us is a very small percentage of stocks are trading near 52 week highs. We'd like to see this number start to expand. When we look at sectors, if I take all of the 40 sectors that we track and plot them on a distribution curve based on what percentage of stocks are performing well, the further to the right you go, the higher percent of stocks within these sectors are performing well. The best performing sector in the market is energy. If it's in capital letters, it means that breadth or the percent of stocks performing well has been expanding, meaning more and more companies doing well. We saw another deal this week, Hess, one of our companies, being bought out by Chevron. <clears throat> that tends to happen early in a bull market for energy. Companies have a cheaper time buying things on Wall Street or Bay Street than they do putting a drill in the ground. So oil and aerospace, which is defense, are two sectors that are showing expanding breadth. Both are sectors we're focused on. Another sector that has a higher percentage of stocks performing well is insurance and specifically property and casualty. We've talked about that over the last few weeks. Then you have oil service, uh, and then you go down the list. At the far end, the weakest sectors, electric utilities, we've talked about being short utilities, biotech, we've talked about being short biotech. Almost nothing's working. Now we watch for signs of positive change, but we don't anticipate. We're going to wait to see those things turn. Let's talk a little bit about the leadership groups. <clears throat> now, a bit of a broken record. Energy continues to be the strongest group, trading very close to 52-week highs. This is the TSX capped energy index made up of uh, a, a universe of oil producers, gas producers, large and small. But you can see this continues to behave very, very well. We talked about Canadian natural resources and how they came out of a consolidation that went on during the Fed's tightening cycle, trading very close to 52-week highs. Paying a great dividend of 4%. The dividend's growing at over 20%. CNQ's paid down their debt. <clears throat> They're raising dividend. Their earnings will grow nicely and trades at a very low single-digit earnings multiple. Hess, this week, again, trades very similarly. Was in a range from 2008 to 2021. Broke out to new highs. And lo and behold, one of the best assets in the oil patch is being scooped up by Chevron, Chevron at what we think is the beginning of a bull market. This is one of the risks that the great companies get bought out from under you at the beginning of a bull market. That's why we have to spread across a number of different companies. We've highlighted that over time, energy sources don't go away. In fact, we're using more wood as energy than you were in 1950. Coal continues to be a very important energy source. Oil, an important energy. We add new sources of energy to meet the demands globally. But to think that we're moving away from oil in the very near term, we think, is, is not realistic. And the world is going to need oil for longer. And large oil companies are recognizing that. And after not spending money on new development for a decade, the only way for them to get capacity is to go and buy it. Outside of oil and gas, uranium continues to behave well. Cameco had a good, strong last couple of days, again, trading close to 52-week highs. And, you know, I put this chart up before, but while technology has been really good at spending on research and development, <clears throat> the energy sector has not. And to update the number of rigs that are active looking for, looking for oil, this is as of the 20th, the rig count continues to fall despite the strength in energy. That talks to the fact that <clears throat> oil companies continue to be hesitant to spend new money. 
Okay, so a number of companies that we own in this group, all generating very strong free cash flow yields, we think likely to have very, very strong dividend growth going forward. Now, this has been the strongest part of the market. And outside of energy, you know, it's been tougher to find good ideas. Energy producers, relative to the equally weight S&P 500, continues on a relative strength basis to outperform. And that reverses a trend that went on for close to a decade where they were underperformers. Keep in mind that energy has been as much as 20% of the S&P in the past. Today, it's about 5%. Over the course of a cycle, it should become more and more important to the S&P composite makeup. Outside of energy, <clears throat> insurance and the financials continues to be an important area. Property and casualty continues to be a well trading above all of the long-term moving averages. We've talked about Fairfax. We've talked about Progressive. We've talked about RGA. Uh, and this is Arch Capital, one of our other holdings. Again, you can see relative strength for these property and casualty and reinsurance companies rising sharply versus the S&P, Arch Capital is trading better than 95% of S&P 500 components. <clears throat> now, I'll be very interested to see how uh, Visa reacts to its earnings. We closed at a relative strength new high earlier than earlier today, trading better than 81% of companies, been very stable, certainly relative to bank shares. And we continue to avoid <clears throat> the Canadian banks. It really is quite something, the underperformance of Canadian banks <clears throat> versus other parts of financials, versus U.S. financials, and versus other parts of the market. A relative strength, new low today for the Canadian bank index. This is an equally weighted index of the five big Canadian banks. So yield is one thing, but if you're getting a yield and you're losing your capital value, not a great place to be. <clears throat> so where people have long-term holdings and they're relatively small parts of portfolios, that's fine. We're just not adding in this group and in our macro portfolio, we're short. Industrials on a relative basis continue to gain ground versus the S&P, trading very close to relative strength new highs, even though they have pulled back a little over the course of the last month and a half. Companies like Stantec in the engineering, w, WSP Global Engineering as well, uh, continuing to perform well. We've talked about Ingersoll Rand and Caterpillar, which have both pulled back a little bit, but continue to behave well. And the defense stocks, of course, for obvious reasons, continue to be interesting. Materials relative to the equally weighted S&P continue to trade above all the long-term moving averages. We've talked about uranium earlier on today. <clears throat> VMC materials, uh, Vulcan materials as aggregates used in construction. Again, trading about equal to the S&P over the last six months, trading better than 89% of companies over the 52 weeks, uh, and looking for 36% earnings growth this year, 19% earnings growth next year uh, on, a, on a very solid cash flow generating base. Healthcare. Now, healthcare continues to be <clears throat> a difficult sector. The advent of the GLP-1 drugs is having an impact on a lot of the companies that produce medical devices. Companies like Bayer that do diabetes testing are under pressure. Companies like Zimmer, Biomet, <clears throat> that produce hips and knees, with the idea that perhaps uh, excessive weight gain gets compressed, they're getting hurt as well. Vertex in cystic fibrosis is making nice gains, trading better than 90% of companies in the S&P and trading close to a 52-week high. Lily, of course, one of the leaders in the weight loss drugs continues to make relative highs versus the market. So this is targeted exposure. Now let's talk tech. Relative strength continues to basically be sideways since May. We're testing support. This is the ETF XLK, which is made up of the very largest of large cap tech stocks. And it's important that we hold this 150 day moving average. So far, from what I can see from the futures trading after market today, the NASDAQ looks to be about flat, so no major negative surprises. I've talked about companies like <clears throat> uh, NVIDIA. We've talked about Microsoft. We've talked about Apple. Outside of those, we do have some other exposure. Broadcom, which is a major producer of chips for the industrial and automotive industry, made a relative strength new high today. 
Palo Alto, very close to a relative strength, new high. That's in the security software area, cybersecurity, performing very well. Uh, and in communications, which continues to gain relative strength, specifically Google, which made a relative strength new high today <clears throat> in Meta. So we need to have some of these companies. They're all cash flow generators. They all have built-in growth. They all continue to perform well. <clears throat> We need to see them continue to perform well. We need to see breadth within the market broaden out so that we start to see some of the cash on the sidelines come back into equities. The place that it's not coming into are the defensive stocks. This is FDL ETF. It's a high dividend paying ETF, largely companies that don't have a lot of dividend growth but have high dividends. They act a lot like bonds and you can see relative price performance continues to be weak. The defensive stocks have had one of the largest sell-offs in their history, roughly equal to what happened in the financial crisis in 2008. So you can see that it's been a market laden with, with, with landmines. In our portfolios, we continue to be quite concentrated. About 17% in energy, which includes producers. It includes services companies. Uh, and it includes oil itself. We have about 16% in financials, but specifically mostly insurance and the card companies. We own Visa. Uh, we have a, a short-term bond position, which is something like holding cash, one to two-year bonds. We've got a 14% weight in, uh, in technology. It has continued. We've continued to take that down with the route in the bond market makes it difficult for high multiple stocks going forward. Industrials are about a market weight and they've been performing in line or a little better than market. Materials are about a double weight, the index, <clears throat> and then we have some cash. The defensive sector end of the spectrum, utilities are a zero, real estate is virtually a zero, consumer staples very close to a zero, consumer discretionary, which we think has the most risk with higher rates, very low and communication services really just the focus in uh, Meta and Google. Look, <clears throat> dividend growth as a theme since rates started to rise has been outperforming. That continues to be the case and that continues to be the most important theme that we have in portfolios. Our tactical mandate can be anywhere. It could be in bonds, could be in preferred shares. It could be in convertible bonds. We're focusing in uh, dividend paying common equities. When we look at the alternatives, <clears throat> the bond market has not been one of them. High dividend paying stocks haven't either. But the since March, <clears throat> the income portfolio is one of the only areas of the market that's moving higher nicely. We're watching volatility. Volatility steams continues to be fairly muted. We're watching credit spreads. They continue to be fairly muted. And we're headed into uh, the stronger period of the year. We'll see whether we see some improvement in breadth coming out of these earnings period. We're gone through the blackout period, which means we don't have a lot of corporate news. The share buybacks by corporations have been held at bay during the blackout period. And now the Fed is in its blackout period. No more Fed speakers over the next couple of weeks. So just to quantify it, <clears throat> Starting on the 21st of October, if you look at historical 10-day returns, going forward over the next few weeks, it's one of the most prolific times during the year. We'll see whether that unfolds this year. In the meantime, we wait to see the market make a new high. We're 22 months out, <clears throat> market's 11% off the highs. I know that this feels like an eternity. If we thought bonds were a real alternative, We'd focus there, but they've continued to show negative returns. Dividend growth, I think, is the most prolific theme. And if it holds up through a difficult market, it's likely to do well as the market starts to improve. If things get worse from here, we will continue to raise cash. And we won't put money to work until we start to see improvement in the breadth models that we track daily. So with that, uh, happy to answer any questions, Pamela. Thanks so much, David. Yes, we have a couple questions here, so let me just pull them up. Um, David, Robert wants to know what your thoughts are on copper and tech 
in particular? Yeah. So we've talked through, we've talked through, we've talked through tech. Uh, you know, tech is going to be dependent on the earnings that we see over the next short while. Copper in particular, let's just touch on that. So um, I've had a number of conversations about this after over the last short while. Copper really is testing us. So this is the consolidation that copper has been in. <clears throat> and I'll just go through the date range. Uh, this is from um, March, sorry, March of 2022. So first thing I'll mention is that copper made new highs four months into the bear market in stocks. That's something that we have to keep in mind. Things that perform well in the face of market weakness are important to watch. But that being said, in May and June last year, had a very you know good sized sell off. Through the course of the Fed's tightening cycle, it's traded in a tightening range to where we are today. So on the lower bound, this is support and we are trading above support. Market actually had a pretty good day for copper today, up about one and a half percent. If we break below this support level and stay below, or if we break above the resistance or stay and stay above, this is going to be this is going to determine where we're going forward. I would say though that I my bias is that having come out of a bear market like the rest of commodities and to be in a tightening range like the rest of the commodities set, uh, um, group was, many of the commodity groups have exited that tightening range to the upside. Copper has yet to do that. And that makes sense because it's probably the most economically sensitive commodity that there is. But given the fact that things like oil and uranium and aluminum have moved out of their consolidation, my guess is we will likely see them move higher. The hard part is, you know, the metals producers are a volatile lot. They move around a lot in price. I look at some of the leaders, and in particular, I think 4N is about the best one in the bunch of the mid caps. It looks really interesting, and it broke out quite a while ago. So I think that that's one of the leaders that I would watch. Uh, but of course, we got to watch the rest. There's Capstone, there's a number of them. Um, uh, the copper ETF is similar to the copper price, continues to be in that tightening range. So this is one that's testing our patience. Uh, but having said that, it's actually holding in well relative to the market. Thanks so much, David. That concludes the questions that we've received this uh, afternoon. So I will leave you with the final word. Thanks again. Hey, guys, I'm not going to, you know, candy coat it. It's a tough market. <clears throat> We need to see some improvement in breadth. We need to see some new groups start to pick up. Um, I have difficult conversations every year in the middle of October, and this has been no different. I think that given the circumstances, we're positioned well with some cash and focus in a couple of the stronger groups. But there's big parts of the market we got to be careful of. The difficulty is that after 40 years of falling interest rates, people have become very used to buying things that do well when rates fall, when things get difficult. And that's been the exact wrong place to be this year. So unfortunately, the most crowded parts of the market are the things that act most like bonds. And I really think it's important to recognize regime change. Regime change is tough because there's a big wrestling match goes on over a long period of time until people ultimately recognize that there has been a major change. I think the market's showing us that. So my suggestion is that we focus in dividend growers, companies that generate lots of cash, companies that don't need to raise capital at higher interest rates, and we focus on those. And so long as they perform well on a relative basis, and as long as they hold up in price technically, this is probably the place to be, but we'll continue to update. So please uh, don't hesitate to tune in again next week. Send in any questions that you have. We're happy to answer them. Uh, and uh, we look forward at some point here to have a better market to be talking about. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you again next week. Thanks, Thanks Pamela. You.